People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dr. Lisa Machoyan is a national expert on adolescent mental health with a specialty in girls and the psychology of women. A Harvard-trained developmental psychologist, psychotherapist, and former faculty member and director of Harvard Graduate School of Education's Gender Studies, she is the author of the first and only definitive book on girls' depression, The Disappearing Girl, Learning the Language of Teenage Depression. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Machoyan to Health Gig. Thank you for inviting me and having me today. We thought we'd just ask you to tell us about you and your story and how did you come to work with girls and young women and depression? I had worked with children since my undergraduate work as a teacher, actually specializing in children with dyslexia. And as I was headed and waiting for an acceptance to graduate school, there was a family tragedy, and I had an extended family member, a cousin, who killed herself after suffering with disordered eating for a number of years, and that really impacted my life. She was you know, a young woman at the time, and my work had always been with children and adolescents. And out of that suffering, I wanted to do something positive to remember her and to be of help to others in the world. So that's what informed my work in looking into the rates of why depression rose so high for girls in early adolescence and to actually speak directly with girls about it because no one had done that. There was also at the time a project going on at Harvard Graduate School of Education on girls' development and women's psychology, but they hadn't conducted any research or talked with girls that were in any type of distress. So I wanted to make that contribution. Why do you think the depression rate is rising in teenage girls? Currently, it's risen quite a bit in the last 10 years. You know, their rates are just unfortunately going up. And What other research says and what I've gathered from listening to girls is I think there's increasing isolation and loneliness despite the fact that in some ways people are more connected. Girls may feel more connected via social media. However, there's less face-to-face and social connection. And there's a lot of research that says that if girls are on social media too much, then the time gets taken away from being with people live and in person. So that's an issue right there because girls very much are very social and very relational. And also what happens is that their popularity and their self-esteem can begin to be tied to how many likes they get or how many people are looking at what they post versus on other qualities of themselves. And there's also a lot of comparing of the self to others for that. I also think the world has gotten very, very fast-paced and a bit more rushed. And also an issue with the phone, you know, the blue lights and sleep deprivation is not helpful and it can actually lead to depression. So there's some of that related to social media and I know there's a lot of wonderful benefits to it, but We really have to take a look at it with the rising rates of depression. What is your thoughts on social media? Do you think that it should be banned completely? Or how do you think it should be managed? Because you're right, they're measuring their likes and they're seeing that they're not invited to a party and all those things that are so important when you're a young teenager. Can you address those sort of specifically? It really results in a lot of pain and lowered self-esteem and feeling left out. And during the adolescent years, and it's happening younger and younger, I used to see 12-year-olds contend with, you're now seeing 9- and 10-year-olds. So, you know, feeling left out, unwanted, it's hurtful and harmful for any human being, but never in the life cycle is the longing and the need for acceptance, belonging, and approval as heightened as it is during the adolescent years, you know, that transition from childhood to adulthood. So I think 
you know, because of the developmental period, it profoundly impacts them. And it's a very difficult question because on one hand, you know, I've got, you know, 10 and 11-year-old girls saying to me, my mom won't let me get a phone and won't let me on social media. And I understand why. And then you have the girls feeling like, well, I'm left out. Everybody else has one. Mm -hmm. And I think it's got to be somewhat broader. And how do we begin to limit some of the hours and also begin to focus more on what people's inner strengths are, their relational strengths, who they are as a person? Because I think it was you, Tricia, that said their popularity and their self-esteem is very much tied to how many likes they're getting, who's going to the party, the exclusion and the inclusion is just very detrimental. And, you know, the younger they are, also they can get, you know, more lured into things that may not be safe or healthy for them as well. It's a big, big question, I think, for all of us. You mentioned that girls are much more relational than boys. How does the social media impact boys as opposed to the girls? Boys are relational too, but girls are very socialized to be relational. I think the social media also certainly impacts boys as well. It doesn't seem as though their popularity and their self-esteem is quite as impacted as girls through social media, but I think it certainly impacts boys. And what I've had young women say to me, you know, I've also taught on college campuses and, you know, and also I hear from young people in therapy and or from their parents that for boys, there isn't as much, you know, social media, there's bullying, but not as much as there is for girls, but there is more access to denigrating images that can then impact them relationally in their interactions with girls. You know, I've had girls as young as 11 talk about things that boys say and are doing that it's very clear it's coming from social media as well as college age young women. So it's hurtful for boys as well. It may, you know, be in different ways for both boys and for girls. But it's a complex and difficult question because it's very prominent. There are a lot of positive aspects of it, but there are also a lot of aspects of it that are making life much more stressful for children and adolescents and young adults. When you talk about the children and the stress and the anxiety or depression that they're experiencing, how much is this idea of you know, happiness and the role of the parents and how we just want our children to be happy? How do you coach parents on that? I think in coaching parents, it's also important for people to be happy, but we also want people to feel peaceful. And how do we help a child feel peaceful and also happy at times, but to know that there are ebbs and flows in life? You know, and this is also, in a sense, how resilience gets built, is how do you manage and contend with bumps in the road, and how do you move forward through those? For example, you know, if something happens and a child isn't or adolescent isn't devastated by it, how do they grow their resilience? If something happens, I can certainly, you know, build myself back up. I can get up and continue on. So I think happiness is an important thing to strive for, but also helping kids strive to feel peaceful inside as well as happy. I certainly want all children and people to be happy, but also how do they find peace, which can also lead to happiness. You talk about the role of the parents. Some parents are helicopter parents, and some parents are non-helicopter parents, maybe not involved enough in the child's life. How do you talk to parents about that, and what do you recommend? It certainly depends on the age of the child and what support the parent needs to do. I'm trained as a developmental psychologist, and what's important is, you know, with development, what things can you help support and foster your children doing for on behalf of themselves? How do we sort of nourish and nurture courage, and what can they do for themselves versus having their parents do that for them? For example, if, you know, advocating for themselves or giving them some courage to speak up for themselves. I mean, there's certainly times parents can step in, but 
in the long run, if it's done too much, it can, you know, give a subtle message that the child isn't really capable of, you know, speaking up for themselves or taking initiative or learning to be assertive. So on one hand, it's how to help children gain the strengths and the feeling of competency and confidence in being able to, in a sense, speak up for themselves. And when is it a point where a parent does need to? Happiness seems to be all the rage right now. And as parents, I find I'm hearing from people and oftentimes saying, I'm only as happy as my least happy child. Can you talk to us about this happiness and are we overemphasizing it with our children? Yes, I think there is an overemphasis on it. And it's not that in any way I don't want children and their parents and families to be happy, but there can be a lot of pressure because there are stresses in life and there are things that happen and people and kids may not always feel happy. And the pressure to feel happy could become a stress in and of itself or to be happy. There was a young woman that I interviewed and she said the reason she couldn't tell her parents that she was depressed was that her nickname was Sunshine. So she kept it from them because she felt like she was supposed to be happy and cheerful all the time and also did a bit of linking it to gender that I'm a girl. I'm supposed to be happy and smiley and cheerful. The reality is, is we are all not happy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sometimes kids feel pressure to be happy and may not communicate stressors, which then could end up snowballing for them if they're not feeling happy and they may not seek help if they need help because they're supposed to be happy and want to please their parents. How do we help kids to feel content and to feel peaceful and know that there are times that we can feel happy but there are also times that we may not feel so happy and how to, you know, cope and contend with those type of feelings and how to manage them. And certainly there are internal and external pressures which can certainly, you know, overlap in this day and age from concerns about having friends and being accepted to pleasing parents and family members to concerns about how girls look and being accepted by, you know, their friends and by one another. So there's a lot of pressures that they may not be able to really articulate clearly to their parents. And the sooner we catch some of the symptoms, the sooner we can say, oh, there's a red flag of depression or anxiety, the sooner we can, you know, intervene and help, the better off any youngster would be. Not that it's ever too late, but the sooner the better. What kind of behaviors are you seeing in depressed young women? There can certainly be a lot of self-loathing, A continuation, I mean, this may sound cliche after all of these years, but there still remains huge issues with body image and what they look like. Also, if somebody is very, very irritable, if they are overwhelmed very easily, right now there is such an overlap. You know, I've been doing this work for many years with anxiety. You know, there used to be a lot more girls and young women coming in with depression, but the coexistence now with anxiety is just enormous. So you see that, and depending on the age, they may or may not be turning to self-harm or substance abuse. You certainly will see behaviors as irritability. They may give up too quick and too soon. So there's different types where you can also see kids, you know, or girls and young women who are depressed but maybe more angry and depressed, whereas some be, may become what we're more used to seeing is sort of more lethargic and, you know, more low energy. And those are often the girls displaying their depression in a more angry and irritable way. What's the difference between anxiety and depression? That's a good question because they're so overlapped right now. Anxiety is more about worrying about the future. They may have regrets and worrying about the past, but anxiety, there's a lot of worrying, you know, worrying about school, worrying about their friends, wanting the approval of teachers, parents, their peers. You know, there's certainly different types of anxiety that we can see in children. And, 
young people, certainly there can be a generalized anxiety where we see anxiety pretty much about a lot of things. There also can be anxiety where it's more socially based, which more and more young people are having now, social anxiety, separation anxiety, and what's a very pronounced anxiety disorder. There's been some debate in the field whether it is an anxiety disorder or where it should fall, but also kids that have experienced trauma and have post-traumatic stress disorder. They also can have a lot of anxiety based on that. But anxiety is unfortunately becoming highly prevalent now in our youth. You know, they may have bodily distress, you see a lot of kids fidgeting and worrying about things. And you know, the other thing that I've noticed that seems to be on the rise related to anxiety is panic. A lot more youth are getting panic disorders and panicking. So having been in this field quite a while, you know, when you work with young people, you sort of start to see the trends and sort of where their shifts. One young woman that I work with said that she really thought that her anxiety was fueling her depression, that she was getting so anxious it was making her depressed. And there's often a lot of overlap between the two. And there are also, you know, things like physical complaints, stomach aches, headaches, muscle tension, and a youth report that came out probably about four or five years ago now that, you know, there's also a lot of physical complaints that can come with anxiety and also depression, headaches, stomach aches, muscle tensions. But the younger the youth were, they were less able to really identify those type of things as related to their anxiety. So sometimes helping kids know, I mean, you always, always want to make sure there's nothing physical going on. If a child or adolescent or young adult has chronic headaches or stomach aches, you always need to rule out anything medical. But when there's nothing medical going on, those can often be physical symptoms of anxiety as well as sometimes depression. I see a lot of overlap between anxiety and depression now that wasn't as pronounced, say, 15 years ago. You know, how do you know if your teenage daughter is having a normal teenage anxiousness or if it's behavior to worry about? And when do you tell your parents, okay, we got to think about a plan? One thing you always want to tell people is if you trust your gut and your instincts, always listen to that. A lot of times people ask, is this normal teenage angst? And unfortunately, that in our culture got quite a bit normalized as adolescence being a time of storm and strife, which one of the first psychologists, G. Stanley Hall, had said. And while that was helpful, it's also sort of made people think that it's carried on and that, you know, a lot of adolescents, unfortunately, get dismissed as this is typical. What you often want to do is look at the frequency and duration of the anxiety or the low mood you know, how long has it lasted? I would not let it go too long, a couple weeks, a few weeks at most. Any abrupt changes in behavior, if they're tending to withdraw and isolate themselves, if you see behavior where they're acting out, are they turning to substances? Are they turning to self-harm? You know, anxiety, you also may see quite a bit of fidgeting, headaches, stomach aches, although you can also see that with depression as well. So any changes in behavior, eating patterns, sleeping patterns, abrupt changes with their friends, suddenly they don't want to go to school, things like that are often huge red flags. And it's better to err on the side of caution because the longer things go, the more they are likely to spiral. So it's better to err on the side of caution because unfortunately right now the rates of depression and anxiety in adolescence is really on the rise. So I would say definitely err on the side of caution, you know, changes in behavior, sleep, eating patterns, their mood, if they changed their friends, do they want to stay home, avoiding school, those kind of things. And the duration, you know, I often say two to three weeks versus waiting months because a lot of things can happen if you wait for months. What happens when a teenage girl is quiet or even silent? How do you get to the bottom of that? Oftentimes, a girl is silent if she feels like someone may not be listening or if she's not being listened to or if there isn't a strong connection. Listening is very important to girls on the research on girls' development. That was what 
girl said over and over and over, you know, what's important to you? How do you know if someone cares? And it was deeply about listening. And I found that too in my research, interviewing the girls for my book over and over. They said compassionate listening. And I think sometimes girls shut down if they feel they're not going to be heard or if no one is listening or if they feel like what they have to say might be unspeakable. You know, if something traumatic or very distressing has happened, that could be something, you know, that they might be afraid to tell. So active listening is very, very important. And it reminds me, there's a girl in my book, and she gave herself the name Grace. I let the girls pick their names. And it was very early on in my training, and people read a referral, and I said, oh, I'll take that referral. And they said, well, did you hear the last sentence? She's been going to therapy for over six months to a year, but she doesn't speak. So she had been very, very silent in therapy. And I'm thinking, oh, what have I gotten myself into? Because, you know, I was beginning my training. And what happened was I shifted, in a sense, the power dynamic because she came in and I started to ask her some questions. And she just kind of shrugged and would say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, which I knew from the research on girls was a bit of a red flag that often girls may know, but they may not actually say what they know. So what I did was, you know, a little bit out of the box, but that's how you often have to work with young people and also grounded in the work on girls' development and women's psychology. I asked her if she wanted to ask me any questions and She did, and she asked me a lot of questions, and they were appropriate questions for me to answer. I certainly took a risk as, you know, a trainee in doing that, but she spoke, and she continued to talk ever since then very actively and fluidly, and later in our work together, I asked her why it was that she spoke, and she hadn't spoken in therapy before, and she said it was because I allowed her to ask me some questions and that I talked to myself and I didn't tune her out because apparently someone she had worked with before, when she didn't talk, she just did paperwork. And her name was Grace. That's the name she picked for herself in the book. And so Grace sat there and she said she was waiting for her to ask another question or waiting to ask something. So You know, I sort of turned the tables and shifted the power a little bit, and that's what she really attributed, because she said, when you asked me if I wanted to ask you some questions, I was like, yes, yay, and (laughs) that's kind of, you know, what did it, at least for her. You know, sometimes girls may not speak if they're concerned they may not be heard, and I guess, you know, it also shifted a bit of the power there. So I would say never, ever give up on a girl who doesn't want to speak. And, you know, maybe there's a way she can, you know, find her voice. And this one certainly did when I asked her if she wanted to ask me some questions. You know, that idea of just never giving up just really resonates. And I think what you were saying earlier, don't wait, that if your gut tells you there's something going on, start reaching out, right, as a parent. Absolutely. And pull your team together. Yes, listen to your gut. And, you know, the kids might not like this, but err on the side of caution because, you know, the sooner we can get youngsters, teens, the help and support that they need, the better off. It can prevent, you know, a spiral. And probably in the worst case, if it's not extremely serious, they'll feel loved. They'll know that you're doing this out of love and care. Yes. Yeah. Which is so important. It's, just so, it's a way that you can show them your love, even though they're not accepting it in other ways. How do you see hormones factoring in? Oh, that's an important question, and I knew I would get asked that a lot. So I specifically researched that. Actually, in graduate school, I did a paper on that. And there's a little bit of a shift going on with that right now that I've just noticed very anecdotally. What the research has shown historically that with puberty, there's also an increase in estrogen for girls. And what the research has shown that, you know, is literally drawn blood samples is, you know, in the increase in depression for girls in early adolescence that is then like doubled by mid-adolescence is very much due to psychosocial factors, not the hormonal changes of puberty, because actually the increase in estrogen should be helping girls feel better. 
So that research found it was much more psychosocial factors, which have increased since that research. However, there's a bit of a recent trend that there's more and more girls right now experiencing premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, basically meaning they have very difficult time premenstrually and can get depressed right around then. And, you know, I'm not sure if that has something to do with puberty coming on sooner, hormones in some of the foods that we eat. You know, there's speculations about that, but that is often where we may see the hormones factoring in when girls have a very difficult time or a mood shift right around the time of their menstrual cycle. At least it's becoming more common, whereas 15 years ago in my work, you didn't hear or see much of that at all. But now it's becoming more common. So I'm not sure, you know, what that is. Is it just, you know, multiple stressors exacerbating things? Is it something environmental? So there is an increase. But overall, the hormonal changes of puberty, girls should in some ways actually be feeling better with the increase in estrogen because we know at the other point in, you know, the midlife cycle with a decrease in estrogen, that can affect women's moods. So girls should actually be feeling better, but there is something going on with more and more girls having difficulties, you know, around their menstrual cycles. Lisa, you mentioned earlier in the podcast that you had a cousin who committed suicide. She had disordered eating, and that's how you got into this line of work for you. How do you know if someone is suicidal? Well, that's a really good and important question, and I can certainly give you answers, and it's also being very attuned to the person. Certainly, if anybody makes any comments at all about suicide or suicidal thoughts or killing themselves, you want to ask. You want to certainly, you know, get them checked, you know, if you have to go to the emergency room or if you can make an appointment with a psychologist or social worker or psychiatrist. It's also being very attuned to a youngster to see any changes. So if there's any talk about it, take it seriously. It needs to be taken very, very seriously. So if a girl or a boy is talking about suicide, if they're making suicidal gestures or comments, you need to certainly get them help right away. Other signals may be, are they becoming very, very withdrawn? And sometimes there could be a slight mood lift, and if they start giving things away, that's a sign to be very aware of. That's a really huge red flag. And sometimes the mood lifts a teeny bit, and people think, oh, they're doing better. But it's actually the mood's lifted enough that they can unfortunately and potentially take action. And if people have made suicide attempts in the past, that increases the risk as well. How do you help parents who have children that are suicidal? Well, you certainly want to give the family a lot of support, and oftentimes it can be helpful if the parents have somebody to talk with as well, because a lot of times it's the child that ends up going to therapy, but, you know, there might need to be family work. Every case is different, so I wouldn't want to overly generalize, but there may need to be family work, some support for the parents. And this is something you just do not want to let go unattended. It needs to be taken very, very seriously. A child or adolescent really needs mental health help and support. And it's, you know, something not to be dismissed at all. It needs to be taken seriously. But often parents need a lot of support and help because it can be very, very frightening to them. And, you know, unfortunately, some of those statistics are a bit on the rise as well. So watching any changes in behavioral patterns and not stalling at all and getting help and staying very attuned. Active listening is very, very important, particularly for girls. I think technology has done wonderful things, but the pace has gotten much, much faster. And we need to be more present in the moment. You know, one girl said, well, I was trying to tell my mom something, but she was opening the mail. And we can understand her mom's home from work, her mom's busy, she's trying to do two or three things at once. But these are times when being very present in the moment, you know, the mindfulness part, I think, is very important to try to be present. The kids are very aware of that. And 
people are on social media so much and on their phones that people being fully present is not as common as it used to be. And if girls equate listening with caring and being present with caring, that's often how they think, well, they don't care because they're not listening or they're not fully present. And parents need support as well, too. You know, as an adolescent struggling with depression, is this something that you can cure or is this going to be something that they'll typically carry throughout their life or what happens? It depends. It does not have to be something throughout life. There are some people that have depression and have major depressive episodes on and off throughout their life, but I have worked with plenty of teenagers who've contended with depression and they're doing great. So there are some that may have to contend with it on and off throughout their life. But that's why getting help and support is the sooner the better, because it's about also learning coping skills and strategies that will help them feel better. Right. right. And also, what role does diet, exercise, and sleep play? I often use the word healthy eating because that's important because a lot of girls are concerned about their size and their weight and disordered eating and eating disorders are still a risk for many groups of girls. So framing it under self-care and how do I take good care of myself? And one of those ways is eating healthy and also, you know, not running on empty, which a lot of girls might do. You know, they'll skip breakfast. Girls tend to skip breakfast more so than boys because they're often spending time concerned about how they look for school. So making sure they're eating right because, you know, if your blood sugar drops, you're going to get shaky and it can mimic feelings of depression and anxiety. That's part of an overall plan of self-care and literally teaching them, you know, some of the food groups. And, you know, I've done that in groups with girls or in parenting coaching and directly with girls. So it's education or psychological education. And, you know, what is healthy eating? Okay, if you have to kind of, you know, rush in the morning, is there a type of protein? You know, to teach protein is going to help with your brain functioning. Staying hydrated is highly critical to your body's functioning. So some of it is, you know, educational and psychological and nutritional education that parents can do or a therapist can do or someone coaching girls can do. But that becomes very important. And I see so many girls and young women who are either skipping meals because they're too busy or they're concerned about their weight and their size and how they look. Body image is still such a prevalent, I wish I could say after all these years, it's diminished a bit, but it hasn't. Working with an 11-year-old yesterday, and that's quite pronounced even at 11 and younger these days. So healthy eating habits and taking, you know, all the ways I take care of myself. We could lead into some of the other ones, but really teaching and educating about, you know, what are some of the food groups? What is healthy eating? And to do that all under the umbrella and auspice of self-care and how do I take good care of myself? Lisa, we hope everyone will read your book, The Disappearing Girl, which will expand on what we've talked about today, which is so important. But we want to ask you, besides your wonderful book, what book do you think everyone should read? I'm not going to overthink this. Do you know what just popped into my mind was To Kill a Mockingbird? Such a great book. Classic. Yeah, very powerful. And what is your favorite quote? I have a couple. There's one that resonates deeply with me. It's not a quote. It's a lyric from a song. May you always see what your life is worth. That's a song lyric that I've loved since my own youth. May you always see what your life is worth, which kind of resonates with this work. Also the quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, no mud, no lotus. That means out of suffering, a lotus flower can bloom. Lisa, thank you for joining us today. We're just so happy to have had this really important discussion with you, and we're just grateful to you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well.